In the summer of 1914, as Europe's armies marched to war, a new and dashing form of warfare was attracting young men from all over the continent. In 1903, the Wright brothers made the first powered flight at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Military commanders began to realize that flight might be useful for war. Then in 1909, the Frenchman, Louis Blériot, crossed 20 miles of sea, the English Channel. As he looked beneath him, he was seeing the world quite unlike anyone before. And that became the plane's military purpose, to give the commander on the ground a bird's eye view of the battlefield, using photography to spy deep into enemy territory. As well as taking photographs, pilots were able to radio their findings back to ground controllers. The only way for the enemy to stop the information getting through, or the pilot returning to base with his priceless photographs, was to shoot him down. But in these early days, that was difficult. The propeller in front was in the way. The first solution came in April 1915 from the French pilot, Roland Garros. He put steel wedges on the propeller blades so that any machine gun's bullets that hit them would simply bounce off. Now, that's obviously not an ideal solution. First of all, because of the extra weight of the armor to withstand the machine gun, and also because you've got one in 10 bullets flying off God knows where, and some even might come back and, and hit your own aircraft. Despite those dangers, Roland Garros shot down five German planes in two weeks. Their pilots never knew what hit them. But then Roland Garros was forced to land in German-held territory. The Germans immediately saw why this aircraft was so successful, and we are really only talking about one aircraft, which uh, cut a swathe, relatively speaking, through the German Air Force at this time. Uh, as soon as they saw the crudity of it, or how they were trying to achieve this firing through the propeller, that they handed the whole machine over to a very talented, very brilliant Dutch designer called Anthony Fokker. Fokker solved the problem and revolutionized the future air war by inventing a gear that synchronized the machine gun's fire with the propeller's movement, ensuring the bullet would always miss the blade. Soon, German pilots were perfecting the tactics which would bring slaughter to the air. We could see it was a German machine, and when it got above and behind our middle machine, it dived onto it like a huge hawk on a hapless sparrow. I was very thankful indeed to return from this outing. Allied aircraft were defenseless. 1915 saw what became known as the Fokker Scourge. An Allied pilot's life was measured in days. The head of the Royal Flying Corps, Hugh Trenchard, ordered that fresh pilots should be sent every day to take the places of the dead at the mess dinner table. If, as an ordinary pilot, you see no vacant places around you, the tendency is to brood less on the fate of the friends who have gone forever. Instead, your mind is taken up with buying drinks for the newcomers and making them feel at home. 1915 was a continuing disaster for Allied pilots. The Fokker scourge lasted nine months. During it, the average life expectancy of a British pilot was just 11 days. Hugh Trenchard knew that losses were inevitable and that, in effect, the war in the air was no different from the war in the trenches in terms of the attritional nature of the contest and the massive casualties that would be sustained before any kind of victory. The air arms race of World War I brought a new and potentially devastating twist to warfare. For the first time, civilians became targets. The Germans carried out the first civilian bombing in January 1915 on the Norfolk coast. Their bomber was the Zeppelin balloon. In May 1915, Zeppelins bombed London. Seven civilians were killed. 
Look, there it is, a long black cigar-like shaped object coming very slowly. I put my arms around my mother and I can tell you, I don't know how we felt. People began to make preparations for the Zeppelin raids. One big wine dealer was reported to have let one of his cellars and people we knew had furnished theirs and slept with big coats and handbags for valuables at the bedside. The Zeppelin raids have a great psychological uh, advantage at first against Britain because Britain has always seen itself ever since medieval times as a secure island fortress. Nobody can touch us as long as we retain our control of the seas. They don't kill that many people compared to the later bombings of World War II, but it's the sheer novelty of being suddenly under threat from the air that causes more panic than one might expect, given the, uh, the statistics. The stalemate of the trench war had lasted nearly two years. Both Allied and German commanders were desperate to break it. Aerial reconnaissance was vital, not only for pinpointing German targets, but also for guiding artillery fire. With their new, improved planes, Allied pilots went into action. Some became household names. The French, in particular, were quick to exploit their aces. By focusing on the lives of the heroes of the air, they could distract the public from the carnage of the trenches. The Germans, too, were quick to celebrate their aces. The best-known German ace was Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. Von Richthofen would shoot down 80 enemy planes, more than any other pilot in the war. I am a hunter. When I have shot down an Englishman, my hunting passion is satisfied for just a quarter of an hour. Von Richthofen became the icon of a romantic view of the air war. Individual knights in shining armor of airborne steel locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat. By April 1917, the Germans were again forging ahead in the tit-for-tat arms race. Part of their advantage was tactical. They began to operate in squadrons of 14 aircraft called Jasters, sending three or four Jasters over the lines at a time. These massive groups became known as the Flying Circuses. The Jasters led to the first great scenes of squadrons rather than individuals dueling, the famous days of the dogfights. British and Allied squadrons would meet the German circuses in the skies over the trenches and battle to the death, often to the amazement of infantrymen below. I can see the scene now. It was just like a, a cloud of flies in the sky, all moving quickly, of course, very quickly, and diving and uh, round one another, and we could hear the shots, of course, but we, they were quite overhead. Superior German planes and the Jaster tactics cost the Allies dear. In 1917, in what became known as Bloody April, they lost 150 aircraft and 316 men. Later in 1917, the first American pilots came over, but German superiority continued. We got into a dogfight this morning with a new brand of Fokkers and they certainly were good. This fellow just hung right there and sprayed me with lead like a hose. All I could do was watch his tracer and kick my rudder from one side to the other to throw his aim off. The life of the airman, although often short, was at least one of relative luxury compared with the lot of the PBI, the poor bloody infantry, in the trenches. When they were on the ground, the, the, the pilot's life was, was very strange because uh, they, they faced death on a daily basis in the skies, but then they'd fly back to, to their airfield, and, and there they had a, a comfortable mess, good food, decent bed to sleep in. We live well. We went down to Boulogne and got an ice cream freezer, and we're the only outfit at the front that has ice cream for dinner each night. In the midst of life, we are in death, and in the midst of death, we managed to have a hell of a lot of fun. 
Bronx cocktails, chicken livers on brochette, champagne, strawberry ice cream, and Napoleon brandy. In 1915, Germany had declared unrestricted U-boat warfare and was attacking any merchant ship heading for Britain without warning. Hundreds of ships were being sunk. Britain, which depended on trade to survive, was under dire threat. Though U-boats attacked from underwater, they still had to spend most of their time on the surface. Planes would be the best way to spot them and could also help to sink them. But finding a way of enabling these early short-range planes to cover wide tracts of sea presented huge technological challenges. The Royal Naval Air Service's greatest contribution to air warfare was pioneering the use of aircraft at sea. Early on in the war, these airplanes would be float planes. To get the float plane onto the surface of the sea, you have to stop the ship and use a crane to lift it over the side. This is uneconomic, it wastes time, it wastes energy. Then to get the plane back on board, the same process, landing the plane on the sea, stopping the ship and hoisting the plane up had to be reversed. The real solution was to enable seaplanes to take off and land back on ships. Some extraordinary experiments began with the Sopwith pup. When one was required to fly off, the platform was quickly rigged up with planks on the turret right up to the end of the guns. In August 1917, a Sopwith pup successfully landed on HMS Furious, a cruiser which had been converted to become Britain's first aircraft carrier. The first thing we had to do was to learn to fly on and off the foredeck. I remember the captain said, you may as well take a revolver and blow your brains out. You have to synchronize the speed of the ship with the speed of the plane which is quite difficult. Whatever the difficulties, a new type of warfare had been born. By early 1918, HMS Furious carried out the first carrier-borne raid, which took off from the carrier using wheeled aircraft to bomb and destroy the German Zeppelin sheds at Tondern. And this is the pioneer of modern aircraft warfare from the sea the aircraft carrier comes of age in this conflict. At the same time, yet another technological breakthrough was happening on land. The birth of the heavy bomber. By the summer of 1917, Allied pilots on the Western Front had once again caught up with German technology. Now both sides would pay more attention than ever before to a new phenomenon the war had brought. Aircraft had been used for bombing from the outset, but now large numbers of older reconnaissance planes were being converted into bombers. Special bomb attachments were fitted, and by 1917, they were in regular use by the Allies. They came in a box, a half a dozen at a time, wrapped in cotton wool. We had no instructions, so we got the bombs, unscrewed the top, and when we wanted one of those detonators, I'd just say, chuck us a detonator, Charlie. I practiced bomb dropping by day and night in all kinds of weather, into and with the wind, and from all heights up to 2,500 feet. In the centre of the aerodrome, a large circle had been painted in chalk, and OK consisted of dropping the bomb so that it fell anywhere within this circle. Bombing was used to try and interfere with the movements of enemy troops. They would try and attack bridges, they would try and attack railway tracks, stations, railway junctions, anything that could impede the enemy. Zeppelins were slow and vulnerable, and the Germans developed a new long-range bomber, the Gotha. 
In the summer of 1917, squadrons of Gothas took off from Ostend in Belgium to attack England. I could now discern a lot of big machines in good formation flying east. I dived on the rearmost machine and fired a whole drum at close range. I had the satisfaction of seeing my tracer bullets strike all over his fuselage and wings. But beyond causing the Gotha to push his nose down a little, it had not the desired effect. I was very disappointed. How insolent those damn Bosch did look. Absolutely lording it over the sky of England. I was absolutely furious to think that the Huns should come over and bomb London and have it practically all their own way. The Germans deliberately fly over in these big white painted bombers over London by day to show that they can do it and that they're invulnerable at the time to the, uh, the British fighter opposition. So it does have a significant initial impact again like the Zeppelins in terms of the panic that's created because of the novelty of the delivery means. The South African general Jan Smuts was appointed to devise a new home defence strategy. The defences proved effective so the Germans turned to night bombing. Poor dear Mary is dreadfully nervous, so he ensconced her in the first floor passage in a very safe place. Then Phyllis and I stole away to the top window. I've never seen such a sight. The sky seemed full of shells. Then there was a dead pause. Very terrifying after all the noise. Then, coming from the east, we heard the hum of machines. We nearly killed ourselves trying to spot them, but we could see nothing in the fog. The last Gothas came in May 1918. The British had also developed their own heavy bombers, like the Handley Page, which had the range to attack targets in Germany. These new flying machines were taking war to a new level. In 1918, General Smuts prophetically wrote, As far as can be foreseen, there is no limit to the scale of aviation's future independent war use, and the day may not be far off when aerial operations, with their devastation of enemy lands and destruction of industrial and populous centers on a vast scale, may become the principal operations of war. What's most distinctive about the air war in World War I is how quickly it evolves. You start out with very, very primitive uh, techniques, observation balloons and observation aircraft. By the end of the war, you've got strategic bombing, fighter squadrons, uh, carrier air power, and the whole panoply of air power as it would later evolve during the century. 